morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining the uh, Faculty of Engineering lecture uh, this morning. Really appreciate that you uh, decided to uh, join us this morning. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this lecture this morning. I am Atze Injecik. I am Dean of the Faculty of uh, Engineering. Therefore, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all here once again. Now, we have uh, a great privilege to, to have uh, Graham Hopper uh, with us uh, uh, this morning to deliver his lecture. Before I hand the microphone over to uh, Graham, let me introduce uh, you to him. Uh, let me to introduce you. Let me introduce Graham to you. Uh, I beg your pardon. And uh, Graham is a graduate uh, of our civil engineering department. Uh, graduated. Uh, in 1996 with a BH in BH honors degree. And he has worked for the BAM Natal for over 20 years, commencing as a graduate assistant site engineer and progressing to project director. He now fulfills the role of BAM project director of the British Antarctic Survey Construction Partnership and BAM South Atlantic Construction Opportunities. Residing in the Highlands of Scotland, Graham brings experience and expertise in the successful establishment of collaborative, open, transparent partnerships with customers and key stakeholders to achieve sustainable solutions. Graham has been responsible for the delivery of a number of major civil engineering contracts. These include works in Shetland, Orkney, Outer Hebrides, South Georgia and Sandwich Islands and Antarctica, and bridge water treatment, rail and tunnel projects in the UK mainland. Having recently returned from Antarctica, Graham welcomes the opportunity to share some of these experiences. We are very much looking forward to, to listening to your uh, lecture on uh, extreme engineering in Antarctica, Graham. It is over to you now. Thank you very much indeed, Graham. Thank you, Attila. Uh, hope everyone is safe and well in these uh, challenging times. It's really disappointing that we weren't able to undertake this in person, but still a great privilege to be able to present to you today in this uh, interesting subject and hopefully share some of the experiences of the, the British Antarctic Construction Partnership. Uh, hopefully you can see my slides uh, and thanks for that introduction. Uh, just a a few other things about myself. Yes, I reside in the Highlands of Scotland uh, with my, my partner, uh, my two daughters and, and a variety of uh, dogs, some, some, some Siberian Huskies and Alaskan Malamutes. So uh, the agenda for today, and hopefully see this should last an hour, if I can get the screen to work, yes, is uh, we'll cover the, the partnership, why Antarctica, uh, some of the design and construction challenges we've faced, but also equally the, the well-being of our personnel, which has been critically important to us, as we have been asking people to, to mobilise to Antarctica for, for up to seven months at a time, leaving loved ones and, and friends and, and, and family behind. So a whole series of adjectives there for Antarctica, remotest, most hostile, coldest, windiest, highest, driest continent on earth. And yet I, I miss it. I've had been fortunate enough to, to go four times now. It is a very, very special place. I said after my first visit to station that you're just filled with utmost respect for, for the scientists and the operational staff that, that live and work there. You're filled with an overwhelming desire to help contribute to, to making their, their life easier. And for myself and the team, we really have enormous pride in being able to uh, help science and saving our planet, really. Uh, it was British Antarctic Survey 
that identified the the ozone layer back in back in 1985 and and the work that they're they're currently doing uh, is very very important to us. And on that, why Antarctica? Well, the polar regions are amongst the most remote and hostile environments known to mankind. Uh, in some ways, they feel detached from our everyday lives, but what actually happens there affects all of us. And what happens in Antarctica has a significant effect on the wider world and its ocean systems. The need to visit is driven by a desire to learn more about our planet and understand how it's rapidly changing uh, due to climate and our human influences. And with the effects in the this activities and the environment becoming increasingly apparent. I think the work being carried out by British Antarctic Survey is more important now than, than ever before. And to ensure that it remains at the cutting edge of uh, research and an adopter uh, for change, uh, the British Antarctic Survey have partnered with, with BAM uh, to upgrade the, their infrastructure. And this has been founded over a number of phases. So phase one is a 300 million pound portfolio of work. It was awarded to, to BAM in, in 2017, but BAS actually started this journey in 2014. There's three main threads. Uh, the first being the changing over their operational model from two ships, the Ernest Shackleton, which was their operations ship, and the James Clark Ross, their, their science ship, into one new vessel, uh, the Royal Research Ship, the Sir David Attenborough, uh, which you may have known as Boaty McBoatface, thanks to the, the joys of, of the internet. Uh, and associated with this was the Antarctic Marine Infrastructure Upgrade to accommodate the new ship, and also the construction of the Discovery Building, which is a new science and operations building in Rovra Research Station. And this, as I say, a three million pound portfolio of work from 2017 to 2024 for, for BAM. Uh, just last week, we, we were delighted to win and, and be awarded the phase two contract, which is 500 million pound portfolio of work, which will take us through to 2031 and beyond. And again, the three main threads in that are a replacement aircraft for British Antarctic Survey, an upgrade to the runway and the hangar to facilitate this, and a renewable energy master plan for the decarbonisation of, of the BAS opera, op, operations uh, and associated upgrade of the research stations. And the partnership procurement model is uh, been undertaken by UCRI, so the UK Research Institute uh, and, and NERC with British Antarctic Survey as the employer. They have Rambo as their technical advisors and Turner and Townsend as their cost consultants. And BAM uh, are the construction partners together with our internal in-house designers, DMC, and our external design partners, Sweco. So just to give you a quick oversight of who BAM is, uh, we are one of the world's largest uh, construction contractors. We are number one in, in Holland and the top three in the United Kingdom. We employ over 20,000 people, uh, operate in over 40 countries uh, and have 10 operating companies within the United Kingdom. Uh, and the main lead for the British Antarctic Survey Partnership is, is BAM Nuttall that are uh, focused on civil engineering works. Probably apologise for the number of words in this slide, but I think it is an important message uh, to get over, uh, just what the aims of the, the partnership are. Uh, the objective of British Antarctic Survey was to appoint a partner who, who shared their values uh, to work over the next decade uh, transparently with them uh, and to deliver projects on time and to value for money. The main aims were developing a long-term collaborative relationship to ensure programme certainty and also with that budget certainty and demonstrating uh, the need for value of money for the satisfaction of, of the government funding bodies. 
a right first time approach in Antarctica, there really is no, no margin for errors. Uh, we needed to work around complex logistics and ensure that, that science was, was able to continue and critical systems weren't, weren't at risk. It was important to ensure the design and construction was fully aligned, uh, that works were trialled and tested off-site to provide that confidence and efficiency and delivery. And in practice, to ensure the foundations for the success of this, it was really fundamental to provide opportunities to increase the performance by collaborative, innovative approach, which generated maximum benefit to all partners. This approach was engaged at the full uh, outcome program level, not, not local scope, gave all partners and importantly, the, the wider supply chain, the tier twos, the SMEs, the, the confidence to, to develop more innovative solutions, to challenge standards uh, and create value whilst also mitigating risk. Really important, uh, almost the analogy of superheroes, Avengers assembly, uh, to ensure the correct people were selected and integrated together, that we embedded ourselves within the employer bases organization in Cambridge so that we could work together, we could develop relationships, develop that trust and transparency uh, through a variety of mediums, workshops, steering groups, and, and even social activities. And throughout that, really considering the key concerns of all partners, uh, and as I said, identifying opportunities and, and mitigating risk. Just really all about partnership. Can't stress that enough throughout this presentation, uh, trying to come away from this uh, old transactional process and instead focus on, on the win-win solutions for all. So one of the first projects was Rovera Wharf. Uh, we like to call it the, the flat pack wharf. This was a 30 million pound uh, project to, to Bam Nuttall, probably about 40 million in total to, to Bass to replace the existing wharf. And this was driven by the need uh, to facilitate the, the Sir David Attenborough. Uh, it required a longer, a deeper wharf. Uh, and I think it was important just to also give you an indication of how the existing wharf uh, worked. Uh, if you see in the bottom left of the screen there, that's a cross section through it. The front face was uh, comprised of sheet piles uh, that retained crushed rock backfill that was restrained by a rear retaining wall uh, through a, a top horizontal structural steel tieback system. However, as you can probably see on, on that, the Rovra is located in a rocky outcrop. Uh, and with that, there's sort of 45 degrees bathymetry. And this requires a sort of complex connection to the, to the seabed. Uh, and what they'd undertaken back in 90, early 1990s when they constructed this was to have an inclined lower tie rod that was tied back to a mid wall and then tied back again to the rear retaining wall. And that created a, a balanced system uh, that allowed the tie rod to follow that, that bathymetry of, of the seabed. Uh, it also enabled a sort of steel working platform to be constructed that could be used as the platform for the installation of, of the front sheet piles and, and to drill the vertical ankles, anchors into the seabed that, that were needed to um, prevent uh, uplift of the structure. I'll just sorry touch on some of the design parameters. So design parameters for the new structure were a 2.4 meter design wave, uh, 15,000 ton moving mass at uh, one knot, about 1.8 kilometers an hour, uh, basically uh, an iceberg rubbing rubbing against the wharf and exerting a crushing force of 1.2 megapascals. Uh, the draft that was required to accommodate the SDA was was eight meters uh, with a 90 ton bollard uh, pool. And you, you'll note from this that the, the new wharf is extending out and into deeper water. And with that bathymetry, it's almost the, the analogy of, of a cliff edge. Uh, so it was uh, putting the structure into deeper water and hence at risk from uh, potentially significantly larger icebergs. 
So some of the design challenges we faced was originally uh, we'd looked at a new wraparound structure. Uh, challenges with that were that the, the ramping vertical forces associated with the sea ice, uh, the risk of ice iceberg damage and this 45 degrees bathymetry uh, together with the existing geology, uh, which was um, granul, granul rock, you know, very, very strong but also heavily fractured. And to enable the, this option to work, we would have required a fixed connection stub pile drilled and grouted into the rock. And these are what some of these uh, cross sections are showing there. But additionally, also would have needed rock anchors tied back into, into the existing seabed to provide the, the, the lateral support. And with this, there, there was a great concern of the risk of both the rock splitting, uh, causing block failure of, of the foundation and, and, and hence toe failure. Uh, there was also significant risk associated with the time consuming process of, of drilling both the socket and the anchors. And also the fact that this was a high risk underwater operation. Uh, and we really wanted to look at trying to avoid as far as practical and underwater operations, uh, particularly because uh, there was marine mammals, predatory marine mammals, leopard seals and orcas that were regular visitors to, to the works. So as we looked through the options, uh, we then considered, could we have the wraparound structure, but still utilize the existing sort of methodology where we had tie rods coming back. But as we investigated that, we, we had concerns uh, that there could be installation clashes as we tried to come through the existing structure, which would cause buildability issues and, and concerns to be able to meet the, the program. Uh, and through that process and undertaking a sort of SWOT analysis, that's a strength, weakness, opportunity, and, and threat analysis, uh, this really left us with the option of removing the existing wharf. Uh, which hence facilitated a similar structural concept to the existing wharf. However, it would result in a compromise situation for bass where there was no berthing facility at, at, between the construction seasons uh, at the start of season two for the, the station relief and operation works as it obviously had to be removed to facilitate the new construction. However, due to the, the strength of the partnership, we were able to discuss this and uh, we managed to agree to revise oper operations such that this structure could be facilitated due to the reduced construction risk profile. And this design comprised of 20 modular frames up to 50 ton in weight, up to 14 meters high. There was 10 rear frames, which you, you, you'll see to, to, to the left here. Uh, the intention for these to be constructed in, in season one in Antarctica and for a temporary front ice wall to be positioned, which would protect the structure due to, throughout the austral winter season and, and the impact of sea ice and icebergs. And then we would remobilize after the winter season in season two to install the front 10 frames, the, the, the sheet piles uh, and, and associated pier furniture. And this method uh, facilitated the use of modern methods of construction by modularization, by prefabrication, which could be trialed in the UK, hence giving us far greater confidence that it could work, reducing time on site, uh, and as I said before, minimizing particularly the underwater works. Uh, and key to this as well was also decreasing, for example, the number of bolted connections it had to undertake in site. So obviously conditions, the, the coldness in Antarctica are um, ideal for that. And that again could, could lead to further frustration in the team and, and delays. And this uh, unique design uh, that retained the sort of granular backfill matrix also enabled the loading uh, to be taken by the, the backfill as opposed to the bending moment within the steel sheet piles. And a typical key, the greatest loading is, is normally berthing and normally ship berthing, and you would normally utilize 
permanent fenders to take these loads. However, in Antarctica, due to the existence of, of sea ice and icebergs, a permanent fender system really wasn't practical. We, we had to use uh, pneumatic fenders, Yokohama type fenders that could be deployed immediately prior to any berthing and uh, then removed at, at the winter season. And this really, to sort of quote one of my designers, uh, the design was uh, like a sandbag analogy. So as opposed to a, a rigid structure, uh, it was able to, to deflect in, under extreme load and also then use the, the benefits of hydraulic compaction to bring it, bring it back to its uh, standard sort of static position. So these are the a picture of the, the back frame and the front frame. Uh, the photograph there in, in the bottom corner actually shows these being delivered and unloaded in Antarctica. And you can see the flat pack. So what had happened was the design incorporated hinges uh, such that we, we could fabricate them and then open them up on site. And whilst at the same time, delivering them to station. It wasn't taking up large voids, uh, which is premium within the commercial shipment. And then these would move together and, and be connected. So just moving on to some of the construction planning and the digital journey we were on. So having established the core team and embedded within the client's organization, we were able to collaborate and do this knowledge share and very much engage with the Bass Logistics team, uh, with their estates team, with their air and ship operations and the science teams to really develop our understanding and, and utilize their knowledge, which has been gained over you know, decades of, of working in Antarctica. We were then able to engage with our supply chain. We were able to instill the same partnering behaviors and provide confidence that together we could achieve best value uh, and that it wasn't the race to the, the, the sort of bottom of, of lowest price. And, and this led to great value engineering opportunities. Um, the, the whole process at each stage was really handing the baton over, not retracing and, and repeating, repeating work. And I can't really underestimate to anyone the, the level of detailed planning that was necessary. As you can imagine on a normal contract here in the UK, you would, you would accept that the planning would be live, so organic process that, that continued through the life cycle of site. However, in Antarctica, for, for obvious reasons and constraints, we didn't have that flexibility. Uh, we had a single charter ship that was heading south to construct this wharf. Uh, that had to carry all the resources. We, we didn't have a, a local builder's merchant or a local equipment supplier that we could use. So everything really needed to be planned months in advance to, to enable the correct level of detail to be obtained and to be procured. And, you know, we would undertake uh, pre-mortems. We would assume that the works had failed and ask ourselves and challenge ourselves why that had happened and then develop contingency plans accordingly. If we would have constructability workshops regularly each week, focusing on sort of bottom-up micro-planning of, of these activities to ensure the methodology, the, the temporary works, the outputs and the resourcing were all fully understood, agreed and bought in by, by the whole delivery team. And these plans at each stage were, were modeled, uh, simulated. We used time location diagrams, we used 4D animations, even used virtual reality construction to, to train some of our operatives, all for the purpose of, of de-risking the program. Uh, and ensuring uh, visual planning and understanding and, and clash detection was undertaken. And this slide at the moment just shows some of that process and also the journey with, with digital uh, we've, we've been through. I think key to this uh, was information management in accordance with ISO 19650. Really is data that is now oiling our projects, uh, data is the new game changer. I like to say, you know, together with the BIM and building information modeling or, or building information management, as others may call it, really is the new technical revolution. It's the, the golden thread, uh, or maybe I should say loop, that, that oils the project and binds it all together. Uh, and it really is key to have that 
proper focus on that. It improves the coordination and the communication, uh, ensures effective informed decision making, uh, and ultimately better quality information and, and, and production. And just to demonstrate that in some way, you know, this uh, shows how you know, if you don't follow the correct information management processes, how a single item of weakness in some of the earlier work stages and the, the REBA, you know, work stage zero or work stage one, how that can affect and provide significant consequences in, in the later work stages. So work stage zero, work stage one being the sort of strategic definition and preparation and brief, and whereas work stage five being the technical delivery on, on site. And as a partnership, we really have embraced this, uh, embraced the systems approach and utilise compliance matrices at, at each work stage, in addition to the KPI process uh, to ensure that we follow these core process objectives to get to get the maximum benefit from from this. And due to that, with the whole embracing digital construction, the you know the, the sound bites we we have used as we wanted to build it before we build it, we wanted to to embrace digital, embrace modularization, make it practical, predictable, and and repeatable, and it really has been been a great success. And and, and credit to all the team uh, for for the Rovra Wharf project. We've believe we we spent about probably four hundred thousand pound on digital construction and received a sort of five fold saving uh, in value of over two million pound in that through working with the supply chain and, and planning our works we also believe that we've saved over 10 million pound in, in value engineering and ensuring the works were able to be completed in two seasons and instead of potentially three or or even more so having undertaken the, the design and planning, all that was really left was the, the small challenge of, of mobilizing to site. And I'm often asked, how do you get to Antarctica? And surprisingly, uh, by quite a variety of means, uh, ship from, from the UK, uh, which is how our, our uh, equipment and plant and, and materials were, were, were taken there is generally well or permitting uh, 30 days, uh, albeit there's a significant constraint where uh, you cannot arrive at Rovra generally before uh, late end of end of December due to the due to the existence of, of sea ice. Also, uh, you can fly there, um, which is a fantastic experience. Albeit it's somewhat nervous, as what happened to myself was one of the engines in, in the plane field halfway between uh, Chile and, and Rovera. Uh, but yeah, it's a great experience to do it. There, there's some photographs there you, you'll see. It's, it's not quite your, your usual commercial airline that you might expect. On the bright side, you can bring your own food and, and you don't have to pay for overpriced crisps or, or, or drinks. And you've got quite a good legroom. Uh, the door is open to the pilots. Uh, you can chat to them. Uh, and, you know, I was afforded the opportunity, which was just absolutely fantastic to, to sit in with them uh, on one, the, the, the jump seat for, for, for takeoff. Uh, and these flights from the, the tip of Chile, uh, well, I suppose, first of all, to get from the UK, it's, it's a couple of days flight uh, from, from Heathrow across to either Brazil or Santiago, and then down to Punta Arenas, the southern tip of Chile. Uh, you would normally have an overnight stay there, and well or permitting, uh, you would fly to Rovra the, the following day, and that could take anything between five to, to eight hours, to, depending on weather conditions. Uh, the pilots are in continuous communication with the research station, as you can imagine, weather can change quite quite quickly. And sort of halfway there is the point of no return where the decision is made whether to, to turn back or, or continue. And I think just touching on the logistics uh, to get to Antarctica, uh, this slide shows just some of the complexities in terms of having to manage and plan uh, the loading, the loading of a ship, 
it really is a major logistics operation. Uh, for the Rovra Wharf, we, uh, BAM and BASS, oversaw the loading of over 4,500 tonnes of, of cargo, including approximately 1,500 individual major items, uh, 83 containers, all the permanent and temporary materials, 1,000 tonnes of steelwork alone, uh, variety of 30 ton dump trucks, uh, 90 ton excavators, quarry crushing equipment, uh, mobile cranes, uh, two number 300 ton cranes that, that were partially assembled at, at the UK port. And if, if you look to the bottom of the slide, you'll actually see how some of the planning of this developed. And you'll note at the bottom that the overall expectations of tonnage didn't actually changed that much throughout this process. It went from just over 4,000 tonnes to, to the 4,500. Uh, but you, you'll notice that the volume increased significantly. Uh, and this was just due to the detailed planning and volume within the ship is just as critical uh, as the tonnage. And for us, uh, it was critical that the shipment fitted in one vessel. These, these photographs here are photographs of, of the various holds uh, and the deck within the ship and just gives an idea for, for the complexity of this. You know, the one ship needed to deliver all the cargo to Rovra. Uh, had to cover all the operations for, for two seasons work and some, some future works. Also had to look obviously to minimise uh, commercial costs to, to the employer. A single shipment to Antarctica, uh, including the management of it at the UK port, is, is circa two million pounds. So you can understand the, the desire to, to limit that as, as much as possible. Uh, and also at the same time, taking consideration that the vessel had to be capable of mobilizing through some of the world's most dangerous sea passages and, and ice packs. And it really was a, a one-off for, for all parties, both in complexity, the, the quantity of cargo within a single vessel, and, and this you know, really stretched the boundaries of commercial shipping capabilities. Uh, it was really a great success when, when the ship uh, was, was able to arrive in Antarctica. I think also tied into this is the biosecurity that's required. The Antarctic Treaty designates in Antarctica as a, as a natural reserve devoted to peace in, in science. So biosecurity measures are critical uh, due to this highly protected habitat. And the Rovra Wharf construction project was one of the largest biosecurity works undertaken in, in the UK. We, we engaged with a specialist consultant. Um, it very much was a, a cradle to grave approach. We, we had to inspect all of our items, uh, both at the supply chains premises at the port where they had to be washed. Uh, through that cradle to grave approach, you know, we tried to design out as much as possible some of some of the risks by um, avoiding voids where, where possible and, and where not. We had to tape these up. We had to prevent the potential ingress of insects or small animals. We had to undertake the inspections, uh, utilize sniffer dogs and, uh, and even smoke uh, prior to sealing, sealing containers. And then after all of that, uh, the crew just had the, the slight challenge of, of sailing to Antarctica. And, and some of these pictures here show that. Uh, sailed for a month and, and safely arrived in the end of December 2018. Uh, prior to unloading, uh, the cargo was all again in, inspected. And then the ship was, was unloaded for a period of 10 days, working 24-hour uh, 20, shifts to enable the construction operations to commence. Uh, the photographs there to the right are actually not the Rover Wharf. This is one of the other projects we had in uh, Bird Island, uh, an island just off the coast of South Georgia and Sandwich Islands, uh, where the bathymetry and, and sea depth didn't facilitate the, the berthing of a commercial vessel. So we actually had to use what you see there as a small tender vessel, which had to make circa 75 trips uh, back and forth to, to the site to, to deliver all our materials. So I think it was worthwhile also just giving you an insight into some of the construction risks 
we faced, as you may imagine, um, these were you know, significantly different from some of the standard construction risks you may encounter in the UK. And due to this, as a partnership, we very much aimed for a high level of risk maturity. Uh, it wasn't just a, an allocation of money. Uh, we wanted to you know, ensure we were risk intelligent, that there was built in decision making, that there was you know, full contingency and a mitigation procedure was all pre-planned and, and ready to be implemented. Uh, we didn't want that sort of natural enthusiastic sort of tribal heroic, I'll, I'll put on another red cape and red overpants and, and a mask and, and, I'll, and I'll be a superhero. Uh, and some of these risks, well, you know, key was the health and safety and, and well-being, as I've touched on before, of, of our uh, construction team uh, and, and the BAS team who, you know, were being asked to be deployed for, for, for up to seven months. We also had to ensure business as usual for science and, and ensuring critical systems were maintained. We had the constraint of the season durations. Typically, uh, British Antarctic survey in a summer season would, would work from early November through, through to early March. We pushed the boundaries of that from, from early November through to actually May, just so that we could ensure this work was, was undertaken in a, in a couple of seasons. We had the constraints of mobilization of our people, uh, as said, and our equipment as said before, uh, we couldn't get the equipment there until the beginning, uh, almost the beginning of January. Uh, we couldn't bring all our people in at once. There was constraints with, with flights and it wouldn't be fair to, to the research station to suddenly have this massive influx of people. And due to the, those constraints, uh, we also had a cap in our personnel numbers. We had the risk that we had to set clear go, no go decision milestones. Uh, obviously, when, when you're going to partially construct the works and, and then leave it for, for six months, uh, that provides uh, some significant challenges and you have to be sure that you, you can leave the works such that, um, that there is no concerns with their integrity. We had to consider uh, time risk allowance, obviously, well in Antarctica, but also, as you'll see from some future photographs, uh, the proximity of aircraft. Uh, operations and the interfaces. We had to consider a plant management strategy. You know, we had to ensure we had sufficient spares and repairs. Uh, you know, if we needed a 300 tonne crawler crane and a 150 tonne crawler crane, we, we would take two 300 tonne crawler cranes because the the impact if it was to break down would be catastrophic for us um, in delaying the works. We also had, you know, limitations with, with lay down areas that are available in, in such a, a small and con congested site with, with challenges with undertaking quarry works, even just with the temperatures with drilling blast holes icing up. Um, snow management was, was a significant challenge, you know, it's an unbelievable amount of snow that can uh, fall particularly between seasons and trying to dig out your, your equipment or even know where your equipment is uh, can can be a challenge in itself and also management of wildlife I, I touched on earlier the pre predatory marine mammals but but also those those in land and you know if, a, if an elephant seal decides to, to lie in front of your your crane uh, it's quite difficult to to encourage it to move so I think hopefully uh, that gives an appreciation for some of the, the planning that went in. I'll just quickly run through the, the sort of theory of taking that through to actual delivery. This picture here is, is a picture of the existing wharf. I said earlier that was constructed in, in the early 1990s, uh, but had now really starting to reach the end of its design life and, and didn't facilitate uh, sufficient size for, for the Sir David Attenborough. So the programme, I'm, I'm sure my project manager would, would uh, laugh looking at this and, and it wasn't quite as simple, but just to give you a, a general oversight, having mobilised the site, uh, the intention was that we started uh, deconstructing the existing Wharf. And it very much was a deconstruction process. It wasn't uh, demolition. It had to be uh, staged, sequenced to, to ensure the, the, the risk of all. 
Uh, and whilst this was ongoing, we then assembled uh, our temporary works to enable the, the construction of, of the frames. And we then uh, installed the rear frames, drilling grouted the raw tankers for that, and, and installed the rear side walls and um, placed the, the temporary mid wall, retaining wall, and, and backfilled this. And, and, and just like that, uh, it was the, the winter season where we had to uh, winterise all our plant and, and demobilise the site. Arriving back some six months later uh, to undertake snow clearance works, uh, assemble the front frames, install these uh, and install the sheet pile walls and, and, and the fendering and then look to, to demobilise from site. And this uh, drone picture, which is helps to give an appreciation for Rovera. Uh, you, you'll see uh, in, in the left-hand side how the 3D and uh, the planning uh, actually came, in, came into practice. Uh, you'll see how close the, the runway is to, to the pier. You also see the variety of, of brown uh, items. That is all the equipment and, and where we've had to try and position it to uh, within the constraints of, of the areas that were available to us. And even just trying to obviously move that about was, was a challenge in itself. So we continued to dismantle the, the existing wharf, uh, removing the backfill, removing the sheet piles, uh, taking it back to basically the skeleton, which then enabled us to commence the, the construction and as I said, the picture that you're seeing here is the frames, both at concept design stage, uh, actually all started with uh, construction by Lego and one of our designers' uh, kitchen floors, uh, moving on to some 3D planning. And then the bottom left there was uh, in, in Southampton, where I think some of the locals were concerned with what the heck is, is getting built here, but it was, it was undertaking a, a trial to make sure it worked. And then ultimately in Antarctica, con constructing it. So this, we had three squads. We had a squad who would be erecting uh, these frames uh, with a squad that would be delivering all the materials to them. And we'd have a squad that were then transporting it through to, to the location to, to install it. And you'll see here uh, some of the green items on, on the photograph are, are, are the, the four jacks. So these frames got positioned. They were jacked, leveled up such that it could be connected to, to their adjacent structures and then they were grouted, grouted in place. That continued uh, through the first winter season. As I said earlier, the, the plan had been to, to install 10. Uh, due to some complications, we actually only in, installed seven or, or maybe it was eight, and we had to come back in season two to do that. So that work progressed. Uh, this is was nearing the end of, of season one. If you see on the right hand side there, the temporary ice wall is now in position and, and the structure was, was being backfilled prior to, to the team demobilizing from site. We then arrived back uh, in November uh, 2019 to continue uh, installing the front frames. And you see the last couple being, being installed in this photograph, uh, which then enabled the sheet pile panels to be placed and backfilled. And I think these two photographs just show you how quickly conditions can change. You know, in a matter of days, you can come from no sea ice to, to a lot of sea ice or from a clear blue skies to, to really almost white out con, con, conditions. And finally, that resulted in the construction and completion of the wharf, which facilitated the, the birthing of the James Clark Ross to to a program, which was a, a fantastic achievement for, for all of the team, uh, equated to 51 weeks construction total uh, period. Uh, the works were, say, delivered ahead of program. They, they were under the target cost. They had done exceptional health, safety, well-being, environmental and quality performance for which, you know, all of the team and all of the operatives and, and management involved should should really be very very proud of and just to touch on some sustainability uh 
sustainability and decarbonation was a key goal for Bass with their, their aims for all operations to be decarbonised by 2040. Uh, and also for BAM, where we aim to reduce uh, our CO2 by at least 50% uh, in this decade uh, and be a net pot positive organisation uh, by, by 2050. And through the partnership, we supported each other in forming strategies to, to achieve this. BAS is very much a key influencer of government policies and together uh, and with the expertise of the supply chain, uh, we integrated decarbonisation, we utilised past 2080 uh, carbon management and infrastructure processes in both the design and construction phase. We put carbon and cost on, on the same page to ensure that we're part of the value engineering process uh, and looking to identify low carbon innovations, uh, whilst obviously ensuring there was no negative impact on the scientific opera operations. Uh, and for the wharf itself, you know, we minimise the works on site, as I've said, by em embracing these digital solutions by the off-site modularisation. Um, we, by ensuring it was practical, predictable, repeatable, it reduced the programme, it reduced the cost, it reduced the resources and hence, obviously, uh, reduced carbon. We recycled the existing materials. We utilised locally available resources uh, to minimise the requirement for additional materials. Uh, and all of this combined to, to minimise the carbon. And as a result of, of that, the project was actually awarded a CEQA award rating of excellent for the, for the whole project delivery. And CEQA, if, if you don't know, is an evidence-based sustainability assessment for, for projects. And to be the first to be awarded this for Antarctic construction really is a, is a fantastic achievement. And following on from this, we're, we're now delivering the, the discovery building the new world-class science and operations facility, which with its energy efficient design, aerodynamic design, will, will embrace also renewable energy opportunities. It will utilize a snow and wind deflector to minimize snow accumulation uh, and clearance operations. So this is very much setting the, the foundations as, as we look forward to the opportunities in, in phase two, where we will continue to work with BAM to really hopefully lead the world in sustainable infrastructure uh, and help to turn Antarctica green. Uh, well, metaphorically, of, of course. Um, so moving on from that, it really wouldn't be possible to deliver the success without having the correct people. Uh, Bassi's aim was very much to build a team with a knowledge of Antarctic construction experience for a long-term delivery program. Uh, to both develop individuals, but also, you know, meet their ambitions whilst ensuring there was a succession plan in place. And in our hierarchy within BAM, we, we aren't so much a management of subcontractors. We, we like to self-deliver and we, we really wanted to, as much as possible, select people we knew. Uh, it was important to have one-to-one -one open conversations. Uh, it is an absolute fantastic opportunity. Uh, to, to, to go to Antarctica, but you know, you shouldn't sugarcoat it. You, you need to share some of the true hard facts with people. There is no hospital uh, that's potentially well or permitting. It could be, you know, you could be a week away from, from a hospital. Uh, there's limited options if, if you were to sustain an injury. It really, you know, helps focus, focus the mind. You know, even if potentially bad news arrives from, from home, there's that. It, Exception, uh, expectation that, that you may not uh, get home immediately. And it was really important for, for both myself, my project managers and my, my foreman to, to meet with personnel to, to discuss this. We undertook uh, pre-deployment training, so onboarding. We would encourage socialization and we would you know chat to the team, but we'd also witness individuals' behaviors and, and see if they had the, the correct behaviors and social skills uh, that would work for, for station life and then really enable them to integrate in, into that. It was also key to, to ensure that they had the suitable foundations of a support base at, at home. Uh, that there was an employee assistance program, that there was mental well-being champions. Uh, and, you know, some of the, the biggest challenges for people actually come 
uh, from the challenges home brings them. You know, they may be in Antarctica and obviously particularly never so more than in, in the last year with the challenges of COVID and whatnot. That uh, you know, sometimes the stress is more so in, in, in the loved ones back home. And we also needed to consider people what was their drivers for, for going to Antarctica. You know, people, yes, want to make money, people want to experience it, but it can't just be driven by by one thing. Uh, Antarctica, you know, and a, and a deployment period of, of six to seven months really magnifies issues. Uh, despite your enthusiasm, you, you, to be able to manage certain things, you, you can't take known, pro, known problems there and, and believe that you can manage them. They will come out. People's natural character and, and, and traits will come out. And we also needed to consider that, you know, people's yeah, circumstances also change, uh, that people who wanted to go might not at the last minute be able to go. We, we actually had people turn away at the airport uh, prior to getting on the flight to South South America. So we needed to ensure contingency was in place and, and the reserves were there and also succession planning for, for future seasons. And tied into the selection of people was a high focus on physical and mental health. Uh, obviously the physical items of that, people had to undertake medicals, uh, there was constraints on BMI, that ensure there was no underlying health concerns. Uh, you know, people would have to have ECGs, uh, dental assessments, uh, and, and just ensure their, their mental health. Uh, the added stress when you know particularly for, for the management staff that the, you're, you're never away from the work site the staff are always managing personnel they're always on duty and, and for all of the team you know you, you're never away from that construction construction site you look out the window and, and you see the jib of a, of a crane and that as well impacts on on your mental well-being and it's really important uh, to know our people to to look after each other to notice the changes that may develop in them, you know, not to ask closed questions, are you okay, but to ask them, you know, to tell to tell you how, how they were feeling. Uh, and, you know, if they at, at some point would have some challenges uh, due, to, due to the period of time. And I think it was really credit to Bass that, you know, they've very much experienced in, in this. Uh, they identified the need to, to promote engagement, dispel any risk over them and us between the science teams and, and the bass operation teams and, and, and the construction teams and, and together ensuring that mental well-being. It was important for everyone to, to understand that very much a guest of the employer to try and give an example of bass, you know, you, you arrive at the research station and it really is like entering somebody's home. You walk in the door, you, you take off your boots, you take off your jacket, uh, you put on your slippers, you know, they offer to feed you, they ask you what you would like, they ask you your interests, uh, they offer you opportunities for, for recreation, uh, and it really is, you know, a fantastic environment, but it's an environment where also small things can become big things. You you have potentially three to four people sharing a, sharing a room. You need to think about that. You need to think about uh, how people will interact. You have night owls together, early birds together, you know, with issues just where, you know, somebody liked the window left open at night and another person wanted it shut at night. You, know. uh, you had concerns were, you know, the, the connectivity in Antarctica, uh, there's minimal Wi-Fi, uh, social media doesn't generally work unless you, you go to the computer room, uh, albeit with that comes some bright uh, sides to that, you know, I think a lot of people are heard often saying I'm, I'm deleting Facebook or Instagram when I get home, uh, don't realise how much time I'd spent on it. And I think it was key, what we wanted to avoid with particular social media was people sitting alone in, in the rooms, because then, you know, you couldn't necessarily see if they were maybe having their own challenges. Uh, but at the same time, one of the things we did develop, because for people to contact the loved ones at home, they would go to what we call the phone booth uh, throughout the station, variety of phones, but that was very hand to mouth, uh, so we uh, facilitated WhatsApp, at least for text messages, and we, we found that made a significant difference. 
uh, to people. Uh, it was no longer hand to mouth. There, there was a bit of two way or uh, communication with their, their friends and family, which, which helped again, uh, the mental health. But I think it was also important to realize that, you know, we wanted to passively promote integration, but, but it couldn't be forced. We needed to consider that everyone had had different needs. Some people were happy to go to the bar and have a couple of drinks. You know, some would want peace and quiet in, in the cinema film room uh, or the library. Others really would embrace the gym or, or recreational opportunities, uh, the music room, the craft room. Uh, and that's just a, an example of, of some of the things we've done. Uh, you know, I had the opportunity to go snowboarding. That's me in the top left, which which was great. A lot of char charity races, uh, a lot of people downloading onto Strava and probably gaining the, the largest number of kudoses ever. And wildlife sightseeing trips, walk walk around the point. Um, a lot of things that was really um, important was to ensure that people had things to, to look forward to. Particularly, uh, focus was in later in the season when there was a higher risk of morale getting lower. You know, there was darker days, there was a, the risk of fatigue, a bit of homesickness. And what we had embraced was with Pass was having an integration manager, you know, ensure that it was something to look forward to, a uh, variety of things, you know, simple things, even, even a Saturday night, uh, you'll, you'll see uh, for, for dinner, uh, was very much communal. Uh, it was a bit more formal, uh, or well, I'll say formal. People were asked to maybe maybe have a shave or put some deodorant on. Uh, but it just had something to look forward to. All the recreational opportunities, the boat tours, ice climbing, hiking, skiing, uh, some football tournaments, uh, table tennis, and, and, and of course, food. Uh, and these really, really helped the team. And I think it's credit to all the work that went in that between season one and season two, uh, we had pretty much 100% of our personnel re returned to, to deliver the works. And just to give you an insight of some of the works we have delivered then, I've obviously spoken here very, very briefly, albeit about the, the wharf, uh, touched on Bird Island earlier. Uh, we also constructed a new wharf at King Edward Point in South Georgia in Sandwich Islands, an absolutely fantastic, beautiful place that I had the uh, pleasure of being able to visit, visit the team there. Uh, and we are currently uh, completing under phase one the new discovery, the, the Science and Operations Building, which is the £50 million, pound, uh, approximately 4,500 square metre building. Uh, and on the bottom left there, you, you'll see um, a computer image of that. Uh, you'll see this uh, curved corner of it, which is the wind deflector, which will uh, push and blow snow away instead of accumulating against it. Uh, and, and you'll see in the photograph what we've actually just finished uh, this season, which was all the foundations and preparation for this coming season where we will go down and the intention will be to get that building uh, wind and watertight. So I think uh, I've probably said a few times, but really as the people uh, and the relationships that have been the foundation of the success, it's great credit to, to all the personnel involved. Uh, here's just some of the words of praise to them from, from our customer. Uh, it's fantastic for me as, as the director to, to read this and to see that the team has been appreciated. I really can't thank them enough. I can't express enough my pride and admiration uh, for what they've, they've managed to achieve in exceptionally difficult circumstances. I would really have liked to probably share some, some further videos with you, but I was conscious of time and also uh, the joys of working from home and some of the connectivity issues we, we all face. But I would suggest if you have some fuller interest in this, that on the B1M YouTube channel, uh, there is a 14 minute video, the world's most extreme construction site, uh, which gives some, some fuller detail and flavor to it. Within the British Antarctic survey site uh, website, there is a variety of videos uh, for over a war final construction season, also for the King Edward point. Uh, and if you, you look at them, you may gain 
gain some, some fuller insights. I'd also point you in, in the direction of the Institution of Civil Engineers uh, for the systems approach to infrastructure delivery. This is a new report that's just actually came out at the tail end of 2020, and it's, it's embraces a systems approach, it embraces the the sort of delivery model, the partnership, similarly to Project 13, which is very much what Bath uh, and, and the project team have embraced as early adopters, and, and you'll find more information about, about this, which hopefully will help you all in, in your studies career. Uh, and I think just to finish up, uh, I'll just say, you know, please stay safe, be, be kind. Uh, it's very important to remember to enjoy this experience projects can be tough as you, the people that, that help make them a success. And, and lastly, I think, you know, thank you all for, for, for joining, but I'd like to give a special mention to all the colleagues at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, you know, I can't believe it was 25 years ago that I actually graduated. It's, it's scary how quickly it's passed. But you know, they gave me the opportunity to, to study there and hence being be involved in such exciting projects. And you know, I've got great pride in the university, I've got great pride in seeing how the campus has uh, developed since since I've left and really seeing their uh, integration with with uh, the construction and industry partners as well. So thank you again and thanks for your time. Okay, I just want to say thanks very much to the speaker, Graham. That was amazing. Um, I'll be handling the Q and A now, um, if that's okay. We've got an, an awful lot of questions to get through. Actually, I've been typing them up um, in no particular order. Uh, starting with uh, Zoe Shipton, she said, "Do you see any opportunities for research into sustainable or extreme engineering that should be running in parallel uh, with phase two construction? Perhaps things to de-risk future activities or." Well, as I touched on with phase two, the, the focus on it is very much all about renewables. It's very much about innovation. Uh, and Bass, you know, as I said, being the early influencer on this. And, you know, if we can do this in Antarctica, then there is absolutely no reason why we can't do this elsewhere in, in the world. And, you know, that is very much the focus moving forward. Uh, phase one has been quite significantly sort of major civils works, whereas now is, is that renewable and, and sustainability. I mean, a related question that came up from uh, Grania was, has anything already been transferred um, back home to more standard construction practice with BAM or in the plans to do so? Yes, it has. Uh, we have been again very much early adopters in the technical revolution of data and digital modeling and we're setting this now as the example for all our projects we're trying as far as possible to to look at that model of modularization uh, within the uk market as well and to limit the the footprint of works on site trying to do as much off-site as possible and with that create opportunities for people you know uh, increase the diversity within the construction industry. There's more opportunities for, for people to work from home, work from local hubs, not necessarily to, to have to, to go to site. I've got another related question off the back of that as well. <laughs> uh, the question was from Gareth. It was, uh, how much has your understanding of health and well-being changed over your career? Um, and has what you've learned in this project influenced uh, BAM's approaches to well-being in general? Or, or do you think that BAM have always been very good a very good question. Uh, I think BAM have been very good. Uh, I think our values of, are founded on that. I think throughout the organisation, you know, I've, I've worked for it for 24 years and, and yet, I'm, you know, many, many people have worked for us for far longer be, because of the values and the importance that, that we place in individuals. Uh, and that's individuals both within BAM and within our supply chain. We've very much embraced partnership and with well-being i think you know we just have to watch the news any day we, we know the challenges that mental health is bringing and it's so important you know never more so when you're asking people to go away from their support base for seven months but it is so important and we very much 
is you know generational process. We've moved away from some of those sort of Conan sort of transactional processes of 20, 30, 30 years ago. And now it's very much founded on, on the people. The people will make a project successful. As I say, projects are tough. We should enjoy it. You know, we want people to be incentivized to, to work for us and deliver it, but we have to consider their well-being at, at the front of, of everything we do. Otherwise, we just don't have a sustainable uh, industry. I'm going to move on to a technical question now to change things up a bit. Uh, Hugh Muir has asked, uh, and a, a few others, another anonymous attendee asked, uh, were there any technical challenges encountered with using materials in low temperature salt water? Uh, for example, did they become brittle? Uh, like, for example, was concrete able to handle the freezing temperatures, etc.? That's a really, really good question. Uh, due to the complexities of concrete, we didn't do any in situ concrete. Uh, obviously trying to batch it, uh, give some quality issues on site. We utilised the uh, precast uh, to, to get over that challenge. With regards to steel, we, we had to be selective with, with the steel grade uh, because of obviously the inclement temperatures, you know, you're, you're working in a temperature there in, in Rovra, which can come down to, you know, minus 20. Uh, albeit for our staff significantly more with, with the wind chill factor. But yeah, it was a key concern uh, and a design parameter for, for our uh, structural engineers. Got another technical question from Michael Fernley saying for external in-ground services, things like electrical comms and fuel, uh, is there a preferred installation method that's different somehow over there? Certainly for, I mean, again, associated with all the works uh, is to try and modularize it as much as possible. Uh, particularly for the, for the M&E works, we're trying to prefab modules, whether that's containerized or whether it's within cassettes, uh, so that, you know, everything we do is to try and reduce the time that we have to spend in Antarctica and the resources necessary to, to undertake the work for a variety of reasons, obviously. You know, it comes at a premium to construct and pay for anything in Antarctica. It's cheaper uh, to do it in the UK. It saves in the carbon. It saves in, in resources. So, and obviously, you know, for for the M and E and the electrical works, we need to particularly uh, consider uh, the the temperatures and trace heating and a number of other things. And that's my actually. Uh, probably a point worth mentioning there is, you know, some of the critical M&A works. Uh, we touched on a ship coming to site, you know, but so some of this key equipment has to sit in storage for, for a number of years before it will be used. So you have to even con consider that within the construction processes as well. We've got a couple of questions about risk as well. Um, what was one of the kind of biggest and anticipated risks, the one that you might remember that hit the project and kept you awake? <laughs> It wasn't phrased that way, but that's how I phrased it. <laughs> what kept me awake at night? Well, <laughs> what didn't, to be honest? Uh, I think, you know, the most challenging aspect for, for the team actually came down to the planning and logistics. You know, once you were actually in Antarctica, and this may seem <laughs> counterintuitive, but uh, the risks were in some way diminished because you had so much contingency. You had your plant there, you had your people there for, for a set time. And in a normal construction site, you know, you're trying to get your equipment off site as quickly as possible to save money. You're trying to reduce your numbers. So, so in some ways, once you were there, and Actually, you know, project manager might have a wry smile, but in January and February in Rovra, it's, 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 it's probably better than, than a Scottish winter where you've got the horizontal wind and rain dripping down your neck. It can actually be relatively pleasant. It's, it's cold, but it's, but it's a dry cold. Uh, so I think that's the biggest challenge uh, for the team was just trying to meet the deadline dates for all that planning and logistics. And then challenge was more personally when they're there that seven months away from from, from family and friends and and for myself you know the, the longest i was actually down for was five or so so weeks so i i found it quite challenging that detachment from the team you know being able to provide that support in the connectivity obviously you, you would be on the phone daily but you didn't have you know the, the same uh reach out to the team to provide that support and guidance and, and sometimes you know professionally that could be challenging but i think it's a uh, credit to the team all the planning that they've done that uh, and 
actual delivery, the, the challenges were, were generally uh, minimal, unexpected, thanks to the digital construction and all, all the works they'd done. Um, so despite the conditions that you described, a few people are asking if they could have a job and if it pays well. Um, <laughs> there, was, uh, there was one thing that was asking um, if you're aware of the Homeward Bound Leadership Programme um, and if uh, it'd be okay to get in touch with you about that because they are organising a, a site visit to Antarctica late 2022 and would be keen to see the works. Um, no commitment, but if it'd be okay to put you in touch. Um, I, uh, I hadn't heard of the Homeward Bound, but I'd be interested to, to hear on it. And yes, please, uh, you know, uh, reach out to me. I'm happy to share any knowledge and facilitate anything uh, with, that, that, can, that can help you, yes. Uh, and yeah, I mean, all of us have mortgages and bills to pay. So as much as this is a great experience and enjoyment, uh, it does pay relatively well. Uh, there needs to be an incentive for, for people to go. But I think as I touched on during the presentation, it can't be the driver. It can't be the sole driver. Otherwise, uh, you know, there'll be, there'll be some challenges. Well, some people are uh, offering to go for free, in fact. <laughs> there you go. Um, well, there's certainly opportunities. There's opportunities through through BAM. There's opportunities through our supply chain. There's opportunities uh, through British Antarctic Survey. You you you'll see these on on the website. So yeah, study hard, and hopefully, you have the opportunity in the future. Um, I tell you, Bill, I don't know how much time we've got left. There's just more questions than I could possibly answer here. Do you want? Should we call it there? I think uh, we should do that, uh, please, Marcus. So, Bill, not can give the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Bill. Okay, well, it, it, it uh, comes to me now to, to give a vote of thanks and uh, many, many thanks, Graham, for giving a, a fantastic and inspirational lecture. I think there's a few of us probably now sitting at our computers uh, planning trips to Antarctica. Maybe easier to say than to, than to do. Uh, we're really grateful for you uh, giving up your time to prepare and to deliver and to deliver the the lecture. You you, you certainly conveyed uh, clearly the design challenges of operating in Antarctica. I'm sure we've all thought about ice and low temperatures, and maybe we thought about uh, transportation challenges. But then you also added in orcas and leopard leopard seals. But you did dwell quite a bit on personal challenges as well, and you can see how that could be quite a challenge for, for, for many people. So it was good to hear the way that you, you added that into your, your lecture. And clearly it was, it was great to, to see the, the solution, the innovative solutions that you uh, and your colleagues in Bam Nuttall uh, came up with in addressing all these, these challenges. You also stressed the, the collaborative work and the partnership and, and, and the people that lie behind the, the projects. It was good to, good to hear about that. Uh, as well. But it was also good to hear that the way that you link things into uh, into climate change. You know, it's, it's maybe something that many of us don't think about, that all the work that's happening away in the other side of the world related to climate change is actually impacting us in our day-to-day our -day lives and probably increasingly so in the coming days and and years. So it was great to, to see all of that. So uh, you, you wrapped all of that together fantastically in your presentation. So thanks again, Graham, for, for doing that uh, for us. Yeah, thank uh, you for the opportunity. Uh, no, no, no trouble at all. Uh, I'd, I'd also like to, to thank the uh, faculty and university support teams who've been working in the, in the background uh, on this. No, I'll, I'll mention particularly Annabelle, uh, Fiona and, and Alan, who've been working in the background. But uh, I would like to give special thanks to uh, Marcus Perry from Civil and Environmental Engineering, who's been doing, he proposed this lecture and has been doing all the uh, liaison work with, uh, with Graham and setting up the, the lecture. So thanks for that, uh, Marcus. Uh, and finally, thanks to, uh, to all of you for, for coming along to the lecture, listening and asking your, your, your questions. Uh, and really with that, uh, I'll now close the lecture. So uh, best wishes to you all. Thank you.